Well, there's an idea that all these gender roles are mm. social constructs. Yeah. Do, do you think that they're just social constructs? Uh, no, no. So let me just start by saying that um, that sex and gender are two different things. Right. And so biological sex, as far as I'm concerned, because I, I was raised in the world of evolutionary biology and the way that we define biological sex is based on the size of your sex cells or your gametes. Right. And so if, if you have large immobile gametes, you are a biological female. Right. And if you have um, small um, immobile or, or super mobile gametes, you're a male. Right. And so and with maleness and femaleness and, there, and there's really good reasons that we describe things this way, just in terms of the fact that this ultimately sets the stage for the minimum levels of investment necessary for reproduction. Right. And so, for example, for mammalian females who have the large and mobile gametes, they all often are the ones um, who invest more um, in offspring production because they are pregnant and they lactate. Right. And so for human females, for example, you've got that nine month minimum investment for reproduction, whereas for the males, in part because they have that small immobile gamete, right, their minimum investment in reproduction is very low. Right. And so in, in these like little tiny differences, you know, sort of cascade into um, and set the stage for the evolution of psychological and behavioral sex differences as well, just stemming from the different adaptive problems or the different adaptive challenges that are confronted fr um, by somebody who has a large investment they have to make in reproduction compared to somebody who has a very small investment that they have to make in reproduction. And so, you know, biological sex is just, you know, biological sex, right? Gender, on the other hand, is is different, right? It has to do with whether or not you feel um, that your sort of set of traits tend to be similar to those sets of traits that tend to be expressed by those who have your same biological sex. Right. So, for example, if I, you know, think that most of the things about myself are actually consistent with what biological females typically express, I'll feel like a female. Right. And th that'll be my gender. Um, but I might not feel that way. Right. I might feel like the bi the traits I inherited um, aren't typical. You know, they aren't the typical traits expressed by biological females. And so my gender would be might might be male. Right. And so those two things are, are totally different um, and they're both important and um, and and both completely valid. Um, and in, 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 in like I said, I th think that gender is super important, um, but I don't think that it should take the place of sex because I think the two things need to be kept separate. Because, for example, even if you are a trans man, right, so you are somebody who is a biological female and you identify male, you're still at a greater risk for Alzheimer's disease because of the fact that you have, you know, you're biologically you're female, right? And so we need to take account of both things. Um, and so one shouldn't be superseding the um, the other. So I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, that, that was you were asking. really well explained. <laughs> and uh, it, it made me think about the gametes, um, the mm -hmm. sperm and the egg, and mm -hmm. how they behave and their roles, and how that translates to our behavior on a larger scale. Like if you look at sperm, there's tons of sperm. And they're all competing to get to that egg. And mm -hmm. that kind of translates to men's behavior. Men have a very large investment in what happens before uh, pregnancy, before just... reproduction. And the egg, is its role is to be very selective, mm -hmm. kind of like the female. And the large investment is what happens after reproduction on the female. So that's, that's one major difference I see in the gametes that translates at large to the behavior of men and women. Yeah, no, absolutely. And what, what's really cool about it is that this tends to um, be something that is seen in all sexually reproducing organisms, right? Is that this diff these, these small differences in the size of our gametes ultimately then, you know, sort of capitulate into these um, differences in uh, behavior, especially when it comes to things like sex and mate choice that you see not only in human beings, but in, in all species of um, reproducing organisms. And generally, because females are the ones that have the larger investment in reproduction, they tend to be choosy. And because males generally have um, lesser investment in reproduction, then they tend to be competitive and um, and not as choosy about sex. And what's really cool is that 
and, you know, there's only a tiny handful of these species, but there are other species. Um, there's like, like I said, there's only a handful of them, but there are some species where males have the larger minimum investment. So, for example, in the pipefish seahorse, um, the female will lay her eggs, um, the male will inseminate them, and then he has to carry them around in this pouch of his, right? So here's this male with a larger minimum investment. And what happens? The males are super choosy because they're not going to be carrying around the eggs of some loser female, right, when he only has so many shots at reproduction. And the females get su are super competitive and aggressive, Right. And so you see these types of sex role reversals based exactly on what the minimum investments in reproduction are. Right. And the more um, the more investment that there is made, the ch the more choosy you get. Right. And the less investment that is made, the more competition that you usually get. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, times I've seen animal like you can go to the beach here and see giant elephant seals. And they're, yeah. the males are just going to war and it's like yeah. this bloodbath, crazy. And then the winner basically gets to mate with almost every female on the beach and all the loser males have to go sulk on another beach. And uh, yeah, it's amazing how this gamete um, biology translates to behaviors across all species and in humans. And, you know, we, we think we're so advanced, but we can't really escape our biology that's hundreds of thousands of years old. No, it's like we can't. And then in some ways we kind of can. And the interacting between our sort of, you know, deeply embedded, um, you know, pre-programmed neural parameters that we've inherited that are, in fact, you know, the sort of wisdom of our ancestors that tend to guide us toward these types of decisions and away from these types of decisions. On top of those, we can also have an overlay of our current environment um, and it can lead to behavioral changes in really interesting ways. Um, and just to, you know, use the birth control pill as a really great example of this, you know, one of the, you know, differences that we see between men and women on average has to do with what we talked about. And that's like choosiness with respect to sexual partners, because for women, you get this large minimum investment that can result from sexual behavior. And for men, you know, there's less of one. And, you know, with the birth control pill, here you have something where all of a sudden, the costs of sex are a lot less for women, right? And so evolutionarily, you know, the, the rule in nature is that, um, is that costs beget choosiness, right? So costliness of reproduction um, begets choosiness. And so here is a situation where we take a pill that decreases the cost, right? So it decreases the cost of um, sexual activity and women become less choosy. And so even though it's like this modern invention that, you know, we've created, women's conscious awareness of the fact that their costs related to sexual activity are low now make them behave more similarly to men than they do to naturally cycling women. And so we've done some research in my lab where we've been looking at some of the sex differences you get in choosiness, for example, or your minimum um, investment requirements that you require before you're willing to consent to sexual activity. And generally you see stark differences between, you know, men having pretty low standards of like what, you know, how much investment their partner needs to make in them before they're willing to consent to sex. And women are pretty steep. So they're over on this continuum. Uh, women who are on the birth control pill are kind of over here, right? Wow. They're a little bit, right? So they still have that pre-programmed neural parameters that are sort of guiding them toward a greater amount of investment before they're willing to consent to sex. But then they also have their conscious level of awareness of the fact that they don't have, you know, they won't probably have to make that investment. And so they're almost in the middle, but they're tilted a little bit toward, um, toward uh, the male side of the equation.